Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Saturdays with Dennis. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Chicago. Great Hi, to see you. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, yeah, wonderful to see you. Well, if, if you're here in an Invested Musician session uh, for the first time, please let us know where you are, uh, where you're coming in from in the chat, put it in the chat. Uh, if this is not your first time, you can also let us know where you're coming from. Uh, it's always great to see, uh, you know, the variety of places where people are, are uh, calling in from. So uh, it's cool. Yeah, a lot of a lot of really cool places, Romania, England, Malaysia, fantastic. Uh, my name is Andrew Bain. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening or any of those iterations. Uh, I'm the principal horn of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Uh, and I'm very lucky to be a colleague of Dennis and a friend of Dennis. It's uh, it's great to hear Dennis play every week, and uh, and I get to learn from him basically uh, every day of the week. It's pretty cool. Uh, so I, in addition to my duties as the, as the first horn of the LA Phil, uh, I teach at the Colburn School, uh, and as part of the pandemic or at the start of the pandemic. Rupal and I uh, began a business called Investor Musician, where we are trying to bring a community. Uh, our community of musicians together with uh, with a lot of information and training and ideas uh, to help to help people improve their playing, help people improve their business uh, side of of our industry. Um, and so we're we're excited to bring these free uh, warm up sessions and and uh, technique sessions uh, on various instruments. And today's uh, obviously Dennis, the superstar of the flute. So um, we're excited to see so many flute players here today. Awesome. Um, maybe if I can just take a minute before we get started too, for those of you who maybe weren't in the first session or missed it, I'm Rupal, um, Rupal Bain. I'm also one of the founders of Invested Musician. My background is um, financial and business and marketing. I have an MBA and um, Andrew and I have been working together on Invested Musician and trying to do what um, support musicians in all of the different challenges that we're facing in lives. So not just on the playing side and the mental side and practice side, but also on the, you know, marketing side, getting up a website, building teaching studio, freelancing, and how we can push all of those forward. Because, you know, as a musician, you're kind of out on your own. So being able to have a community and a support system is what we're trying to do with Invested Musician. And I think we shared the website before, um, but Dana, if you could put it in the chat and I'd, I'll just show it to you guys really quickly because as you know, last week we mentioned we did open for enrollment. And so this is a really unique opportunity to work with Dennis this summer. We only, we only run the program over the summer. Um, this is the website. This is how you can find information about it. It's just 12 weeks. Enrollment closes in uh, mid-May, but we've already started um, accepting people. Uh, you can check out, read more about it, and then just click here to apply to work with us and fill out a quick little short application and schedule some time to talk with us. Hey, Eric, we talked to you earlier as well. Um, so good, we've already chatted with a few of you. You can see kind of what we're about here, you know, additions, growing income, uh, focusing on really building out your career as much as possible and let, working with not only Andrew and Dennis, but four other principals in the LA Phil, plus amazing world-class faculty who are all experts in their area. Um, so we have these, we have this five-star mastery method. It's about practicing effectively, performing consistently, winning jobs and auditions, creating income, and then getting all of that organized so that our time is being used efficiently and you know we're getting to do the things we love in life. Um, so we have some information here about our alum and um, some of what we'll be doing together. Andrew and I also have a, an extensive video course that we put together. So the whole program is live. It's about three hours a week live classes, but we also have um, 10 modules and all of our content. We wrote a book. We didn't think anyone would want to read it, but we put it all in the little mini video lessons. And so all of the content is there as well. So you get it, you get access to all of that um, as well as, you know, Dennis and feedback on your playing about seven times a month over the summer. This is um, a snapshot of our faculty kind of scroll through here. Um, and there's, there's the summary. So we have an early bird bonus right now for anyone who joins by the end of um, March. 
here and the first 10 people are going to get an extra free uh, private session with Andrew. So coaching session on anything you like. So I just wanted to give that a, a quick look for you guys. So if you want to check it out more, I just encourage you to click apply to us. There's it's no obligation. It's just a free consultation where we can chat more about it. And you can at least learn about this pretty cool opportunity. So thank you all for listening. And I'll pass it to Dennis. Good morning and good evening. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all here. So for today's class, I thought um, I will, I, Dana summarized everything in an email for me and um, I thought I will just go over the things you were putting in the chat last time and feel free to, to ask um, more yeah. questions. Oh, okay, that's Dana. So please ask in the, in the chat and then if we have time, we will get to that. So one of the questions was, essential practice routine when there's only 30 minutes to practice and um, uh, so I wanted to talk about that in general practice first because um, I hear things especially uh, you know nowadays it's it's popular to do mental practice you know, uh, I heard students say, oh, I practiced five hours today. I did one hour in the practice room and four hours of mental practice. And I'm exaggerating, of course, but, you know, I thought that sounded really funny because, okay, while, of course, you have to study the piece, look at the score, listen to recordings, you know, um, and that in some way counts as a practice, I guess, but it's not really playing your instrument. So I wouldn't say I practiced four hours if I only spent two hours in the practice room and another two hours, um, you know, listening to the piece and studying it. Um, so if you're counting that as your practice, I think you shouldn't because our, uh, what we do is very physical and we can be compared to athletes in a way, right? Even though we're artists, but um, we use our body to play. And if you don't work it enough, I think you, you can't improve enough. So, um, that comes to the question also, which was not asked, but I, I, I have heard this question many times, how many hours a day should I practice? Um, and I think it's important that at some point in your life, you put enough hours. Of course, if you are busy with three kids and, you know, rehearsal in the morning, uh, teaching a few lessons in the afternoon, uh, driving your kids around and playing a concert in the evening. Yes, it's hard to find three hours to practice in between this, probably impossible. And maybe that's where the question came about the 30 minutes to practice. But um, I just wanted to make sure if you are a student and you have only 30 minutes to practice, then you have to change your schedule somehow. Because I think having only half an hour of practice a day is not enough to even stay remotely in shape for me personally at this point even. Um, I've played the flute for over 30 years now and I find it one hour of playing is absolute minimum I have to do just to stay sort of afloat of being in okay shape. If I want to be in a good shape I need two hours a day and that you can maintain good shape but if you want um, you know if you are in your late teens or um, early 20s and you're studying in a college, I think you have to make sure you, you get a few hours a day in the practice room of really serious practice with your mind in the practice. So I don't count putting a Netflix show on and um, playing your scales as real practice. You know, I know we all do this. I, I'm guilty too, you know, occasionally, <laughs> especially when you're really out of shape and it's, it's painful and whatever, you know, so once in a while, yes, but if you want productive practice, I think it's really important that you are 100% there and you're focused on what, what you're doing. Um, so if you have only 30 minutes, I, I don't have a routine which I would do all the time. Um, I don't believe in that personally. If you're doing the same thing every day, how are you going to improve? You know, um, I think it's the same as again, going comparing with working out or athletes, they, they rotate their routines, they change it all the time. And I think so should we. So if, you, if you're doing all the time your long tones and your scales and your moise every day for 
20 years, you know, chances are you're not probably going to improve a lot. And uh, it's fine sometimes just to get your, you know, your embouchure going. But um, I think I personally like to, to all the time play something new. So um, if I have only one hour to practice and if I don't have something I have to practice at the moment, for example, if it's just an orchestra weekend, I already know the piece. Um, I would probably spend it playing etudes, a book of etudes. If um, Again, this can be different for, for everyone, depending if you're trying to work out through some issues on, in your playing, that's a different thing. But if you're generally in okay shape, um, for me, the best practice is just open a book of etudes and sight read it. And I think it's important to keep your brain active, to, to keep doing different things. So I rotate, I can show my iPad. I don't know if it's in focus. Um, okay, so these are the Etude books I have in my Etude folder. So I would randomly pick one and here we go. You know, um, try to read through that. I think it's it's a great practice for your brain. It's great for your fingers, for your embouchure, for everything, because you're not repeating the same thing over and over. Um, but when it comes to exercises, um, I think you know it's it's always interesting to discuss what everybody is doing because we all have our favorite things. So um, I'll share some of mine. I like practicing harmonics because it's sort of fine tuning uh, the speed of the air. So you could start going just. If you like, sorry, I hope it's not deafening. Um, so just go through the, the whole range of harmonics and um, up and down, slowly a few times, maybe on different notes as well. I'm especially interested in the moment when you change the note. So what exactly is happening? Uh, you probably notice it's different things happening depending on which harmonic you're getting, right? Some of them are harder, like... So it's not just the airspeed, but there's also some different um, angle you have to find for, for each one. So I like practicing that um, and then making variations from these, something like Okay, so pairs of notes and then broken arpeggios and uh, things like that. So whatever you, you feel like. Um, and then I would take some hard notes, like for example, if you finger low B and you play D sharp harmonic. And diminish it to nothing and focus especially on the moment when it's very, very soft and that moment getting from very soft to nothing, I think um, that's the point I would like to focus on because that practices maintaining the speed of the air for soft playing, right? So you don't let it drop to the note below. Uh, and that's where harmonics are really great because the next note down is very close, right? We have only one third, major third interval So once you slow down a little bit, you start hearing the note below coming in. So I'm playing D sharp, but I hear the B gradually creeping in. So um, the goal is not to let that happen. So when you're practicing this diminishing notes, 
you try not to get any of the note below in your tone. And it's okay if you have some air remaining after. I think it's a good starting point. Later you can find a way to clean it up, but as long as it doesn't drop, that, that's a great start. Um, if you are accelerating when you're playing loud, you start overblowing to higher harmonics. That's another uh, good practice as well with harmonics. So playing fortissimo, keeping the same note with good quality. I don't know if my mic gain is too high, but so just like for playing softly we, we try to sometimes it helps to think accelerate the air because the tendency for our body is to slow down same when you play loud when you're playing fortissimo you have to tell yourself to slow down the air because uh, our tendency is always to overblow and go faster and then this happens, you, you start forcing, right? So you get this sharp sound. So instead, tell yourself to slow down the air and just let it go in the flute. So you find that feeling um, of the same air speed. So it's just the column of air gets wider when you're playing louder. So these are the sort of things I would explore for a few minutes, you know. Um, you kind of rediscover this uh, every day in a way because every day is different, right? We, we never sound the same two days in a row. Um, there's always, you feel a little different, you have a little headache, you're tired or you're feeling great, you're in a good mood and bad mood, the humidity is higher, it's lower, temperature is higher or lower, everything affects our playing. So I think it's important that you sort of have a check with your body where you are today. You know, this is uh, what warm up is for, I think. Um, then I would go through scales. Still, I, I like practicing scales. I think it's never, it's never too much because half of the music consists of scales and arpeggios. And you know, if you play Mozart concerto, it's all scales and arpeggios from beginning to the end, isn't it? So um, that means we have to practice them in a musical way. And that is the most important thing. So really, even if you're watching Netflix <laughs> and practicing it, don't do. You know, don't practice like a machine. I think it's really important that we always apply um, phrasing to, to scales. So always go to the top of the phrase, let it relax on the bottom. So you, if you're playing EJ4, which I personally love, Daphne and Gobert. Make sure you always go to the top of the scale. too fast. At first start slower and gradually maybe speed it up a little bit but only if you can maintain that beautiful phrasing. So then the next scale when you go to make it sound as if it was a, a piece of music. Um, after going through all the scales, then maybe it's time to, to find some etudes. Um, I can just share my favorite books, like absolute favorite, which I keep coming back to. Altez 26 etudes, I'm sure you all know that. It's one of the greatest books I think ever written for flute. I find if I have only time to play through those, I feel better the next day. It's sort of uh, because it's working on so many, so many different things. Each etude is very specific. So um, Altez, of course, all the Anderson 
Etude's Opus 15 is one of the most beautiful, but also 63, Opus 60. Um, Boem, Boem, Etude's Bozza arabesques uh, are beautiful too. It's a little a different sort of practice when you're feeling not just, you know, working on scales and arpeggios, but something more impressionistic sort of uh, colors than Bozza is great. Uh, first now, Jean Jean, um, Carl Gellert, of course, Kohler, 30 uh, Virtuoso Etudes, Opus 75. It's one of the books I discovered sort of relatively recently. I like it. Um, expressive Etudes of Kohler, Opus 88. A, I mean, all of these are uh, great. And Moise, of course, we, we know the 480 exercises and uh, 24 melodic studies and all these books. But also, I love the uh, Big Intervals book called 20 Exercises. Wait, can you see? Yeah, 20 Exercises and Studies. Um, so this is one of the books. I think we did one of the classes last year on, on these. And these, if you're out of shape, um, I find coming back in shape with this book is the easiest. Because you, um, you start by playing number one, goes like this. <laughs> I need to practice this today. Um, so early. So when you you practice these, don't don't follow the metronome mark because sometimes I find them too fast. Even seventy two per eighth note, it's it's a slow tempo, but um, I like to play it even slower than this and really focus on the connection between the notes, especially at this moment when you go. So find exactly what happens in between the notes. And what I would avoid uh, always is this. I hear um, sometimes people trying it and you, you have a little gap between the notes. The most important thing is to have that legato connection between. So really focus on... So um, you could also practice the same bits of this with harmonics going... If you if you are finding the the speed of those notes, so I would play through number one and then number two is similar. It's just different intervals. He's going like. Etc. Um, hello. Here. Okay. Uh, Oh, somebody's asking for a list of this. Yeah, sure. Um, number three is also similar. And then number four comes to something completely different. It's uh, practicing trills. Um, and here we're touching on technique a little bit. I think trills are in general something we don't practice enough. You know, we sort of um, deal with them as, as we find them in pieces. But don't you find sometimes it's some of like, you, take Bach sonata in E major, for example, the last moment, or Mozart G major concerto. The trills can be really something very difficult in um, this sort of places, or all of these places. We sort of don't really spend a lot of time practicing those. And that's something Moise does in this book. So you go, etc with all the trills so first whole tone trills then um, half tone trills and if you practice this uh, when you get to the second line I, I like to add the little resolution to the trill etc. 
hours. So you also practice that moment. Um, I, I found at some point trills were giving me a bit of trouble and also know your, your weak points in, in your fingers. Um, for some people it's playing G to A flat trill. It's the pinky because this finger is dependent uh, they're sort of tied together with the, with the fifth finger. I use piano numbers, sorry, I know some people like using violin numbers, but for me, this is five. So fifth and fourth uh, finger uh, tied together a little bit. So it, it, that can be difficult because of that uh, for the trill. I find that for me, the hardest trill is this one, uh, C to D flat. It depends where you place. And the problem is because sometimes this is too close so exactly where you put your hand matters a lot for for this trill i think and probably that's why people use bow pep and all this to just get a little more more space so the finger is not at this angle but a little more like that um so i love this book and it, it goes on with octaves and more intervals and then there's a exercise which was inspired by rigoletto opera there's a part there I don't know if any of you played this. Um, so it can be a little difficult if you're out of shape. And I think Moise played it and um, made this exercise. So you start forte on the low note and you climb up to pianissimo in the top and, and practice these. And you go all the way to top C sharp. <clears throat> so, of course, at that point, dynamics are a little bit relative, you know, uh, with pianissimo. Don't, don't kill yourself trying to, to play too soft at the top. Um, anyway, so I, I actually didn't have an exact plan for this class, so sorry if I'm focusing too much on this. So this is one book I, I love practicing almost, I'd say I, I would touch it every week at some point. Um, and then play through etudes. So this is the, the sort of warm-up routine I use, but if you don't have a lot of time, sometimes I think it's okay to jump straight into practicing pieces. It happens, you know. It, again, it depends on where you are in what stage of life, but if you are like on a busy day between students, between concerts and rehearsals, this can be the only solution sometimes as well so and that's okay but it, as a general rule i try to to spend some time just focusing on you know warm up i'm sure and all this um another question i got in the email was about double tongue double tongue and it's somehow especially in this country people are really obsessed with tonguing but it's funny that Everybody is always focusing on double tonguing and on the speed. And somehow when they practice, a lot of flute players, they, we don't want to focus on the quality. And I think uh, it should start from that. So first you get good quality and then you move on with the speed, like with everything else we do, right? So um, since it's such a hot subject, I will <laughs> share my ideas on this. So the most important attack for me is no tongue. And that's something uh, a lot of people don't, don't do much here too. You, you sort of learn as a kid that every note must begin with tongue. But as you grow up, you realize it couldn't be more wrong. Uh, pretty much every first note I play would be with no tongue, especially in a slow movement. Because do you really want to go um, you know, if you're starting a tune, do you really want it to always begin? I think it's a definite attack. Sometimes, yes. If you're starting Mozart concerto, for sure you need to tongue that note. But if you're starting a slow movement of it, why? Don't you want it to be um, sometimes a singing note rather than this way, but so it's 
so this attack for me a melodic attack is very important so i would spend enough time practicing that um, and a couple things about this be careful not to go from below you have to always go from above the note so the air goes so it's starting above the flute and going in and of course it's a very quick thing when you're playing So you can practice that moment, you know, sort of put the air in and out of the flute. You know, so you can uh, then try to play it softer and see what happens with the air. So to get a softer attack and lower dynamics, of course, we need a bit more precision with the embouchure, so start wherever it's comfortable. But it's really important that the air is the right speed right away, so that's why it has to begin from above. Because if you're starting from below, it will be a, a little rough. You know, it, it's hard to get that... Um, starting from from nothing for a moment so getting ah movement um so getting the right angle is very important um and then yeah let, let's move on so this is no tongue is one important articulation another articulation nobody talks about is pa p with your lips um it's sort of not even in any book as far as i know but it's a very useful articulation in the upper register if you play softly so you start by with lips closed and then let the air push it if you play Prokofiev Peter and the Wolf for example you know this I find it's much easier than using real tongue because that G sharp at the top, it gets a little too rough, you know, if you do that. So um, if you play Leonore, you know, P can be very, very useful. So these are sort of articulations people don't really practice a lot, but I would also spend some time exploring this. Um, another articulation uh, we don't use often is ka in slow playing. And I find that lack of clarity of ka is sometimes very useful. So when you don't want a note to be really clearly articulated, but you sort of want semi-soft attack, ka can be useful too. So see if you like that, you know. You know, if it's in the middle of the phrase and you want just a little bit of clarity without making it uh, too too articulated, the uh, car can be very useful too. Um, then let's go to Anderson, Opus 15. That's uh, number nine, I think, there. The E major etude is what I use for, for practicing various attacks um, for double time, essentially. You probably guys all know this book very well. Okay, this is number nine, this etude. Uh, and 9b, if you have, I mean, sometimes it, it just says repeat again with doing this, or you might have another page. So this, um, sorry, my printer is suddenly working. Um, <laughs> so you start by playing single tongue. The first one. And I think this is a great etude for practicing that. To get a bouncy, nice, clean single tonning. It gets more difficult as you go on. find 
all these intervals and different dynamics. Uh, it's a great, great etude. So play it like that first, and then um, I would play the entire etude again just on cut. When we talk about double thunning, everybody is thinking of ta practice and then suddenly fast double thunning. And there's little in between. So I, I think you have to explore the, those parts in between. So practice ka alone, just ka. and it's definitely not going to sound the same as top. But you'll be surprised as you go on for a few minutes, you will improve. And you sort of find, okay, I can still focus my sound okay. It's not going to sound amazing, but... Find a way to make it sound okayish, um, and I think it's important that we we practice that separately because ka quality in the end is heard on every other note, even when it's very fast. Still, every other note is with that articulation. Uh, then you can alternate. So third time play through, you can play a couple bars on ta, a couple bars on ka, something like this. Try to make them as similar as possible and you will find the timing is a little bit difficult too because ka is slower and th that's the reason why a lot of the times when we're playing double tuning the ka comes a little bit late um, so you adjust as you go try to then change to maybe one bar on each articulation <laughs> Uh, can be a little confusing for your brain. <laughs> then you can try four notes, two notes on each. And finally, I also like playing through the whole thing with double tongue in this tempo. And that's another thing, for some reason, I haven't practiced also my first 15 years of my life, I haven't done this. Uh, I mean, flute life. Um, I haven't practiced double tongue at this speed, it's always faster. So try this really. And try to get as perfect timing as, as possible. Because you will find ka always tends to be just a tiny bit late. So be really hard on yourself rhythmically and with quality of sound. So you try to, to get almost equal quality of the notes on this. And finally, when you're done with this, then you can start sort of um, speeding it up. And one of the important things to realize, and I think many of you already know this, but still, the faster you get with tonguing, the longer the notes have to become. So when you're playing at slow tempo like this, we want clarity, and we want space between the notes. But when you're playing at very fast speeds, we want just the opposite. We don't need clarity because when you get really fast, um, it's unnecessary to go... You know, it sounds too harsh and not beautiful. Uh, so if you play Voliere, you know, it sounds ridiculous if you, if you are doing the same articulation in fast tempo. So the faster you get, the, the less um, clarity we need the less accent so you need more legato so you could also try slowing it down and um, analyzing what you're doing I think for me 
it's really important that you get continuous air. So just when you're playing, the same way as legato phrases. So I, I like practicing this going like this. So it's a legato way of blowing for this. And then you speed it up. So nothing changes uh, in the way you send the air into the flute. It's only the tongue movement which you're adding. Uh, if you're trying this, often what you hear is is a, like a switch between legato and staccato, and that's what I think we have to get rid of. So really, when you're thinking of fast double tonning, that, that's essential. So then um, maybe number nine B would be hard to go immediately with. You could do four, four repetitions for each note to start with. on that legato feeling and then you can switch to, to three, three or two or whatever number of notes you want. Um, another attitude for the same kind of practice is Altez um, F sharp major etude. I don't remember the number. Anyway, uh, it goes like this. kind of sounding a little bit like mandolin or balalaika or you know one of these instruments and I think the goal is kind of similar to um, to get that phrasing you know um, like mandolin would do they grow on the note and uh, make the phrase happen so don't just go This kind of practice, but always, always try to make a phrase out of this. Um, then, what else with articulation? I mean, this we we could talk forever about articulation because then there are all kinds of more difficult things for your brain. Um, Altez is actually one of the reasons I love that book is because it practices so many different articulations. So, for example, number three goes like this. So you have a slur on every other note, like that, you know, this sort of articulation. Uh, I find for this, for me personally, I, I like to do ka, because it's an off beat and my brain is used to that. And then when you switch to, when it's on the beat, then it's ta, because if you do ta all the time, That's one of the cases I find that too strong. So if you do, see, ta, uh, ka is softer and it, it can be easily put in the middle without uh, without an accent. Um, and number seven in Altez practices two legato, one staccato. This articulation, which at first is very comfortable, but then if you go on later, it changes to one staccato and two legato. So he puts first the, the short note, which is difficult. So uh, you practice the same articulation but changing the beat, right? So. I find that is harder. And then the hardest way, of course, is when you have no tongue on the beat itself, but you have 
So that sort of hurts your brain. Um, if you never practice that articulation, you will find it very difficult at first. But once you get it going, it's, it sort of um, becomes almost automatic. That's also where I would use ka, you know, on, on the weak beat always. It's an amazing book for, for practicing articulation. Um, do you guys have any questions? Sorry, I wasn't even looking at the chat. How do you correct information during playing? Well, okay, that's that's a good question. How do you correct intonation during playing? Position of the tongue in the mouth, changing the aperture of the embouchure, how to help students to improve this aspect of playing? Uh, Tina is asking. Um, I mean, with intonation, you have to realize that it's just dependent mostly on the air speed. So if the air is slowing down, you will the, the pitch will go down. So if you're doing... And that's the way beginners always do, right? Uh, when we start, we, we feel like, okay, I'm gonna play louder. And when you play softer, it gets flat. So that's the, the nature of the flute. But if we keep the same airspeed, what else can we change to get softer and louder? So if you think, if I don't slow down the air, how do you get softer? You have to change the direction of the air. So you waste more and less of the air goes in the flute, right? See, if you, if you start blowing away from the flute, it gets softer because most of it is wasted in the air. And I think if you explain that to the kids, that we just change the amount of air which falls into the instrument. You know, you sort of, uh, if you want to play Forte, the same thing. You don't force it. Don't try to go with more air because it breaks. It, the flute cannot take it. Instead, what you have to do is put the air down into the flute. So I find playing louder, it's not pressure, it's the opposite. Everything is relaxing. Sort of let the air just fall into the instrument. Rather than, you know, don't do this, but instead tell your body, relax, send the air slowly into the flute. This way. So for forte, basically, don't accelerate the air. For piano, don't get slower. So tell your brain, slow down for forte and accelerate for piano, lift, lift the air to, to get softer without going flat. And then you find that also, if you make it slightly thinner as you diminish, you can get it cleaner without all the... If you want to avoid this sound at the end, then you have to do something with the air stream. So just you direct it up and also make it a little thinner. So the air gets um, gradually a little bit thinner. So that's, I think these are the basics of intonation. For the tongue position while you're playing, I, I think it depends on the register and on your um, individual anatomy you know everybody has slightly different shape of everything so i don't know there's a general rule but when you're tonguing where is where is your simple tongue and it is uh, where does it touch i think yes b behind the teeth above the teeth uh, above the upper teeth there at that space mostly um, but as you get faster another thing you have to realize is that the tongue has to move less when you go really fast, the tongue is almost not moving. It's uh, just floating on that air stream. And the air column is what supports the tongue, right? So you sort of float on top of that. So when you're doing...
most important thing to focus on is the air itself. So you have the, the column of air and then the tongue is there just to, to give some clarity to this. Um, but not the other way around. You don't start the air with the tongue. So it's not, but it's, the air is there and the tongue is on, on top. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> um, what else? Since we only have a little bit of time left. Should I go through the chat questions with acoustics? Which acoustics is the best for practicing? I was thinking in bad acoustics you could work on projection and maybe sound. Um, I like practicing in, in bad acoustics, it's true. Uh, something very dry. But I think also, uh, so in the house we have like few few different rooms we practice in. And um, one of them is a very nice sounding room. And when I'm in good shape, I like practicing there. But occasionally you want to practice in the closet or somewhere with really no echo. You know, I'm not sure about projection itself. I mean, that's not dependent so much on acoustic. I think it's more like focusing on your body and opening up your throat and um, getting the, the right focus in the tone. But it can help to hear more details of your own playing being in a drier room, of course. So I think um, if the practice room is boomy, it's very hard to, to hear the fine details of your tone. So I would definitely um, recommend practicing in a drier room. Okay, what else? Um, how do you change your routine when you were playing a lot of extremely high notes like classical symphony? Um, I mean, you don't necessarily have to change it. Are you talking about the practice itself? Like for the, um, is that referring to the slow movement of classical symphony? I imagine probably, right? Not, not the fast. I think if you're playing um, something like the slow movement of Prokofiev uh, classical symphony with pianissimo at the top, not to get your embouchure too tired. You, you have to make sure it's relaxed as much as possible because um, at some point you will you will find this feeling and probably m most of you already did that you can play very soft with very relaxed embouchure so because it's not uh, yes here here's the thought we, we always think we we form the embouchure and then blow through it that's the concept for most people um, but you can see, especially from my embouchure, it's not the case because I cannot do this without the flute. You know, I, I have crooked embouchure and there's no way I can, I can do anything remote similar to that without the flute. I think it's the air which forms your embouchure. And that's one thing you have to think about because uh, you're blowing in the lips. It's like um, sailing, right? So you have the wind and then you have the sails which are moving to direct the boat and it's the same with the flute so the lips are just there to direct the air in the right direction you're not actually blowing with the lips the air comes from here from your lungs so you're exhaling and the lips are navigating that so the embouchure is formed by the air and the air is supporting the embouchure not the other way around so when you're playing soft in the upper register If the air is at the right speed, it's really easy to do. It's not, you will find you don't need to use your muscles almost at all. You just have to gently open it. So something like this. Um, so practicing that high register shouldn't be such a strain for, for the embouchure. That said, of course, when you're, you know, finishing a last note in the piece or something, we get nervous and we start using more muscles sometimes than we want to. Um, if that happens, I would always think of the airspeed. Like if you're finishing the last note and holding it. I would make sure the last bit of air is going fast enough so it doesn't crack, so you don't, you don't have that uh, stress. Sorry, it's sort of um, floated away from the question a little bit. <laughs> okay, what else? Any alternative fingerings important for you? Well, fingerings could be a separate hour or conversation but yes there are many fingerings I use on a daily basis for both for intonation and for color these are the reasons we use them for right so 
uh, flat fingerings, sharp fingerings, and um, sensitive fingerings, what Wib calls them, for, for different color. I don't know if you're going. Sorry, good. I'm stuck in my own fingerings. So something like that. It's not, it's not always the intonation alone. Sometimes you just want a different color. Or sometimes it could be a replacement for a harmonic printed by the composer because a lot of composers put harmonics thinking it will be such a beautiful thing like on the violin, you know, flageolets, and then instead you get this ugly sound, you know, for harmonics on the flute. So um, sometimes you, you find alternatives for those, but that, that's a whole other conversation. So how are we doing with time? We're almost there. How do you change routine with the playing? Okay, that's all you. some questions I can't answer because it will take too long <laughs> as a child did you ever dream that you will become such a successful and good physicist and where were there times when you felt hopeless of course I mean we, we all have ups and downs I think you know our profession is very unique we fail 99% of the time and it's important not to let that sort of depress you it's inevitable part of life because when you come to an audition there are 100 people and only one gets the job and sometimes none you know that happens a lot too nobody wins so 99 people end up feeling bad on the day um i remember i played some some audition and felt upset came to Wim for a lesson and he said Oh, it's okay to be sad for a day but tomorrow is another day you know put it behind you and sort of let it go and i learned to i sort of learned this feeling to have a thicker skin and not not care and another interesting thing is people once they achieve certain level they're afraid to hurt their reputation so they stop taking auditions or doing things because it might hurt their reputation if they don't win I think that's rubbish too. Just do whatever you want. I mean, nobody cares at the end. Nobody will remember that you took something and didn't win. Nobody cares, really. At the end, we think everybody's looking at us all the time, but in reality, it's not the case. So don't let it um, upset you. I think just focus on what you want to do. You know, if you genuinely love music and that's what you want to do for the rest of your life, then, then go for it. Um, of course, you have to have some reality checks, you know, are you going to be able to sustain your living doing that and all of this. Um, and it's okay also to do something else on the side, I think, too. you know, you, everybody finds their own way with, with music. There's no formula which works for everybody, right? So, yeah, it's, it's also another conversation, but um, I think they do touch on this in the Invested Musician program, actually, right? The mental training and all this and how not to get depressed and <laughs> focused. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so guys, should we wrap it up or do you, any more questions you want me to answer? I think maybe we should. Yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot of questions, but I yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, Dennis. This is incredible that you're doing this for the I am community. I know we all appreciate it. Everyone's saying thank you in the chat, and thanks to all of you also for joining us and being part of the I am community and family. Um, hope you got a lot out of the sessions, and we'll try to do a little recap here for you. And I, you know, if you want to check out opportunities and ways to work with Dennis more this summer. Um, and really take your playing to a new level, then, you know, please consider us and we'd love to work with you. So thanks everyone. Thank you everybody for listening this whole hour. It's really nice to see your faces and reaction and uh, fun always to, to see so many flute players. Stay healthy and have fun. <laughs> <laughs>